You may take your seats. I'm pretty sure you don't know the people around about you, so go ahead and say hello to them. Where is Nathan? What I'd like us to do is, those of you who are featuring in our pop-up sessions, if you wouldn't mind coming just to join me on the platform, I'd like to give you all an introduction and also to honor you for saying yes to the invitation. Nathan, tell us what's going on behind you. Hi, everyone. So I felt to paint today, I really felt Jesus' victory. And uh, he's, he's often called the Lion of Judah. So it, he's, he's powerful, he's strong, he's dominant, he's, he has all the authority. And uh, yeah, this, so that's what I want to do, portray today. If you folks could come out from the shadows and just line up here, that would be great. But Nathan, your most recent work of art is featured out in the foyer <clears throat> or in the in the, that space out there. <laughs> um, maybe you can just give us the motivation and some of the dynamics around that. Yes, well, that, that is a collaboration with a very well-known South African artist. Her name is Mandy Johnson. She would have loved to be here. Unfortunately, she's hurt her back. But um, that, that sculpture is uh, based on a scripture. There's an inscription there. Um, uh, it talks about the wild olive being grafted in. So it talks about the welcoming in of all people into Christ's Christ's house, into the house of God. So if you look, it's, it's a steel base uh, filled with water. The, the roots are made out of concrete and steel. So if you look at those roots, you might think that they are actual sticks. They are sculpted concrete roots and grafted in are these perfectly straight copper, po copper poles. And it, it's a really good analogy between the nature of man and the nature of God. But we're still connected to, to him through his, through, through his divine life. Wonderful. So while well, that was Mandy's concept, you are the sculpture, correct? Yes. Yeah, we just got to get that right. Give the man credit where it's due. Um, Nathan's also going to be doing a pop-up just in a couple of words. What are you going to do? Well, the pop-up is a little taste of a course that I'm running in May for art and faith, viewing art through a Christian lens. So it should be really interesting. Wonderful. So behind me are these wonderful people who've all said yes. And uh, we've got Maureen, Maureen, Nadine and I, together with her husband, Kenny, have a long history. And Maureen travels the world, so we're very fortunate to have her. Um, she has a very, very strong prophetic gift, and she's going to be ministering on dreams. Just uh, a sentence or two about your pop-up. So I'm going to be looking at dreams, but not to interpret your dream. I'm going to be telling you how you can interpret your dream. I feel very strongly that um, the curtain's been torn. We can all hear God. Dreams are simply God speaking to us. So each one of us can hear God speak to us through our dreams. So I'm going to be showing you how you can interpret your dream and how you can look at the different symbols and the different things that are in your dreams. How cool is that? Who's going to the dream session? <laughs> Woo, that's half of you. Gee, <laughs> this is Bianca all the way from Hillsong. And uh, she, um, I hope I get this right, you basically do all of Hillsong's social media, correct? And there she goes. So they have lent her to us for this occasion. And we so appreciate them being able to release the gift that she is. But Bianca, in a few lines, tell us what you're going to do. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we're going to just chat about social media. So we're just going to have a conversation of what social media is in the world today and how basically we can bring the kingdom of God into our social media space and what that looks like um, for us as a church. Are you going to cover how best to pose for an Instagram photo? <laughs> <laughs> and this is Taryn. She heads up our social media, oh, social justice. All right, okay. And uh, she comes to us, and she's a real gift to the body of Christ, she really is. She carries an incredible slant on how to bring change in the nation, especially through education. That's her background, and uh, early child development and all the rest of it. What's your pop-up gonna be about? So my pop-up's gonna talk about Proverbs 11, verse 11, which talks of the righteous blessing the city, and as a result of that, it's thriving. Um, and so I'm very excited to talk about biblical justice and how we apply that in our context in everyday life. Who agrees we need that right now? Oh my goodness, wonderful. And then we have Claudia, uh, her and Cameron are gonna be, the pop-up's gonna be about the word of knowledge and about gifts of the spirit. Um, and this should be happening in our churches. 
And so she is gonna give us some handles on how to release this in the congregations. Hi everyone. So, I mean, words of knowledge, often when we think of them, we think of them only in the context of healing, but today we wanna to expand your thinking and, and help us as a, a people to realize that words of knowledge apply to so many more areas of our lives. <clears throat> and we would like to, to just develop this lifestyle of being connected to God, that these things just overflow in our life wherever we go, business, school, the shops, uh, that this should just be starting to flow out of us. And so, yeah. How cool is that? Good, and this is Trevor. Everybody knows Trevor, so I don't even think he needs an intro, but Trevor has a strong gift. Uh, not only a preaching gift, but he loves God. He's an anointed young man. A young man, can I still call you that? <laughs> hey, look at, he's claiming it right there. But uh, he has a business forum and has initiated, it's spilt over beyond the boundaries of South Africa. It's now gone international. And so what are you gonna tell us about? So I, I firmly believe that business is as high a call in the kingdom as a lead pastor leading a church. And uh, if we're gonna see our nation change, we need business people who have, who have tapped into the Holy Spirit. He is the grand strategist and we have access to him 24 um, seven. Many business people will know about IQ. Many business people will know about EQ, but what I wanna be chatting around is SQ. How do we start having a spiritual quotient to unlock what God has destined for our, our cities and our nations? How cool is that, spiritual question? Who's ever heard of a spiritual question in business? Hey, they're called angels, all right? <laughs> and this is our very famous movie producers, actors, everything else, they have a string of awards behind them both. And so here we have Luke and Kareen, who's gonna speak? Morning, um, yeah, so we're in the film and TV industry and we, our session is about exploring storytelling and faith. And uh, we're just gonna share our experience and where we come from, we've got some handles. If you have a story in your heart, whether it's for a children's book or a TV series or a movie or lots of different formats, um, and, and you feel God is pushing you to, to get that out, uh, we hope to give you some handles and uh, yeah, just give you, you know, unpack our experience in the film industry. Cool. Uh, Nathan's ready at his turn, so we've got Paul. Paul recently produced an album called uh, Heaven Isn't Trembling, and so a lot of the artwork that you see around pertains to that album, and Paul is gonna be handling songwriting and all the dynamics that go with that, so tell us a little more. Yeah, uh, we know uh, music and songs are a great way to communicate truth, and we are living in a world that is desperate for truth, am I right? Desperately needs truth communicated effectively. And so songs are more than just words. Words are very important, but music enables those words to be carried in such a way that they actually communicate on a deeper level. So why on earth bother writing a song? <laughs> and then how, how to communicate, not just through your lyrics, but actually through the music itself. So, yeah. Cool. Sounds great. So for those of you who have a leaning in that direction, something very special is happening there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Really wonderful to have you come and be part of this and saying yes to the invite. And <clears throat> One of the things that Nadine and I have felt is that over the years, I remember we were in Chicago and uh, we were doing one of those bus tours. And I remember the person who was driving us around, they said, Chicago is actually a city in a garden and something dropped into Nadine's heart and she said, what about having a church in a garden? And so we um, frequently are down in the Cape and of course she loves art and so what she notices, we might go to see one of the great wine estates that are there, but she'll always notice the sculptures and one of the things that she said was, why do we have sculptures on the campus? And so of course at that stage we did have a resident artist which was Nathan and we went to him and we said, Nate, can you do sculptures? And he said, yeah, I can do anything. And so what you'll see around about you is all of Nathan's work. Um, and it's simply fulfilling what we feel God has told us to do is to have a church or a campus that really expresses the beauty and the creativity of God's heart. And so what we have found happening though, is that people from all artistic walks of life are starting to visit us. And so it's the law of magnetism, I guess and it just has to do with people who are drawn to where they feel that they identify. But um, what we do feel is to make sure that we still keep making an impact in the secular world. And so Nathan continues to display his art and 
uh, and exhibit his art in, in a secular field. Um, and uh, just this morning, one of our artists, there is a, an art show which is just open today in commemoration of the start of the war in Ukraine. And one of our artists, Dean Henderson, is actually there, his, one of his art pieces. Uh, it's all about the war. And I just forget the title of the art theme, but as artists do, they display the horror of war. And one of our artists actually is the crack the nod to come and display. And so what I'm wanting to say is that I do believe that we need to continue to think about and pray about creating a platform where Christian artists certainly get recognized, but not only that, they get the prayer support, they get encouragement so that they continue to be a light in a very dark world. And so what you have to do is just create a platform. And so that's really how this came about, was we thought, if anything, it's gotta be worship first. Would you agree? So all things have to grow out of a place of worship. We've got to grow out of getting a perspective from God first. God, what did you mean when you created the world and you said, it's good? Good means fit for purpose. And so if I have an artistic gift, I've got to make sure that I continue to be relevant and continue to be fit for purpose. And so that has really kind of gathered our hearts together as an eldership. We've looked forward to this time. We thought, well, let's put it in the diary anyway. Um, in terms of who comes, great, it's a start. Let's not despise small beginnings. But let's get Tom Ingalls to come in and let him launch the first one of these that we have. And so as we contemplate how this looks into the future, God willing, of course, there might be some tweaks and some changes, but at its heart is gonna create a platform for artistic expression that will benefit the church generally. But we also want to pick from other flows and not just draw from this address. Well, we haven't quite done that. We've got Maureen, she's from another flow. We've got Bianca, she's from another flow. And the idea is just to draw people into a space where their art could be valued, where they could be recognized, and that they could see that as they, we're always gonna have worship. Worship's always gonna encapsulate what we're gonna do when it comes to creative art. It makes sense, doesn't it? And so without further ado, I wanna invite Tom, who's a good friend of this church, um, in 1986, Nadine and I attended one of his psalmody courses and uh, that changed our lives completely. How many of you have done psalmody? Look at the hands. Wow, that's a good section of you, hey? And psalmody is really a, a wonderful, wonderful starting point. It's kind of the cement block from which you can launch. And ever since then, uh, we have always felt to embrace Tom and Barbara and the ministry of psalmody. We've run a psalmody school and on Sunday night, we graduate some of our students. And so, uh, hey, it's good to have you, Tom. Wonderful, why don't we give him a good <laughs> welcome. Here you go, mate. Amen, praise the Lord. So good to be here. It's, uh, it's really such an honor to be here. And I just want to thank you, uh, Pastor Ash and Nadine, for inviting me. We're so blessed. I was so excited when I saw it was gone beyond, uh, you know, not a Tom Ingalls event, we don't want any of that, but to see the, the creative uh, side of it, you know, people that are creative and coming to contribute, I thought that was fantastic. This is a wee bit shaky there, we'll put it there. So yeah, it's a privilege, it's, uh, it's such an honor. Uh, we're living in Sydney now, uh, we've been there for 20 years and I pioneered a church there 20 years ago. I had been in, in the States before that with uh, doing some stuff with Integrity Music and then uh, we felt Sydney, so we went to Sydney 20 years ago with my four children, and we pioneered a church from scratch, and so I'm honored to say my daughter's with me. Would you just stand up, Kirsty, and greet the people? She's with me today. She's now, um, she's now pastoring the church. She's, we handed over earlier this year, so she's now pastoring the church which uh, allows me to travel a little bit more. And, uh, you know, the, the, the passion is still there, you know, with this message of worship. It's never left me in 40 years. Uh, I had an encounter with God 40 years ago, uh, just probably a kilometer from here. I was a music director at the Rama Church and uh, God came into my room. I'd never experienced anything like that. And uh, yeah, I was left with this prophetic word. And when, when the Lord left the room, I, I thought this is really strange, you know. I went to my wife and I says, Barbara, you won't believe this, but God just came into my room and God spoke to me about the state of the church before, just before Jesus comes back. And it was like, you know. So Barbara read it, she says, Tom, that's definitely not you, that must be God, but let's not tell anybody. So the whole idea was let's be cautious, let's not tell anybody. But um, 
I went to Pastor Ray and I said to him, you know, this is what happened. I don't know what it really means, but I know that what we give God regarding worship for, let me just say 20 minutes, half an hour before somebody preaches, there's, there's a dimension beyond that that God is looking for, and it's a lifestyle of worship. So I started developing a course, and uh, people came, and I said, if it works, there's the principles. Go try it. If it works, let me know. If it doesn't, then we had a good time. And so they come back and they said, this stuff is working, man. And then uh, a couple of years down the road, leaders came, pastors came from different denominations. And uh, I gave them the material. I says, go and see if it works. They come back and they says, this stuff is working. We've implemented it in our churches and it's working. So I realized that it was something of God. I felt very humbled by that. And then Pastor Ray, we had these massive conferences in those days. And people would come from all over the world. You're probably aware of it as South Africans the Rhema Church and the impact it had in, in this nation and in the nations of the world. And so Pastor Ray got up and he says, Tom's got a word from God. Um, you pastors need to be there. So uh, Monday morning, the place was full of pastors from all over the world. And I shared the prophetic word with them. And uh, before I knew what was happening, I was getting invitations to travel, which was quite something because within a year or 18 months, I had to resign as a music director at Rhema. And, uh, and then travel and take the message into the nation. So I've been doing that for a long time, but my heart is, is, uh, is still there. It is still there that before Jesus comes back, he will come back for a worshiping church. Amen. Can anybody say amen to that? Can you sense that? He's not coming back for some Mickey Mouse church that's lost in the wilderness. He's coming back for a church that's passionately in love with him. He's not coming back for people who are in fear of the stuff that's happening in the world. He's coming back for a church who have the fear of God. The fear, the trembling fear of God's word. That's how the scripture puts it. Amen. That we tremble at the word. That we realize the incredible privilege we have even to open this book up. This is God's best thoughts written down for you and me. If God had to do it all over again, he couldn't do it any better. He says, Tom, I've given you the best that I could think of. You know, this is it here, right here. And so you and I have the privilege, and I'm going to speak prophetically a little bit about that, maybe not this session, but you and I, if this is the generation that Jesus comes back for, there will be a quickening, an acceleration in this generation like no other generation. Because God has spoken about the glorious church, the end time glorious church. We, we can't even imagine what that is like. But if this is the generation, and it could be, I'm not saying it is, but if this is a generation that Jesus is coming back for, there will be a quickening in this generation, an acceleration in this generation to carry the gifts and everything else that God has given us. Amen. You're going to surprise yourself. Hallelujah. If you, as you lend yourself to the Holy Ghost, we're all going to be surprised at what God can do. Can I get an enthusiastic amen? All right. Don't, don't, don't be too slow with it and don't overdo it. Keep some for, for more, for later. All right, listen, I've got a few books here. Um, worship, the Worshipping You talks about the prophetic stuff that's going to happen. There's so much will happen in the church. And I believe that. And I got this 40 years ago, the whole Asbury thing that we're seeing happening right now. I spoke about that 40 years ago. I've written it down. It was part of the Samity course where our churches will be filled to overflowing that you won't be able to get people in, but it won't be happening at a, at a geographical area like Brownsville only. It'll be happening all over the world because my heart is the local church. So we're going to start to see revival taking place in local churches all over the world. Amen. I want you to get this picture because I'm going to give you a prophetic picture of a church that is not yet, but a church that is on its way. The restoration of the tabernacle of David talks about a church that has fallen down. So the church right now is in a fallen down state but it's going to be raised up. Thank God for that. Amen. It's going to be raised up to something glorious, something fantastic, something we can't even imagine beyond our wildest dreams. That's the kind of church that Jesus is coming back for. I, I wrote a book on worship heals and the connection between worship and healing. And there is a connection. Worship is the environment for healing. And this covers quite a bit of stuff, physical and emotional healing through worship. You know, um, Healing actually starts, I had a very good friend called uh, Kim Clement. Some of you may know him, a great, great prophet. Um, born in South Africa, went to America. And him and I became really great friends. We traveled together, we did things together. Phenomenal prophet, probably the greatest prophet um, in our time. But he passed away 
a couple of years ago, and I was devastated by that. You know, it just, it was incredible, 62 years old. And I says, God, that shouldn't be. Why was that? And there's reasons why these things happen. But it was, it was that that led me to write that book, Worship Heals. And I saw something, I saw something amazing in that. And the Lord said to me, he says, the, the healing that the body of Christ is gonna experience in the end times is gonna be because it starts off with this, which is probably what you don't think about. It's having a revelation of long life. If you've got a revelation of long life, you'll probably live long. Amen. That's where, that's where healing starts because, because as you start to set that, that you're going to live long because God promises us that, right? He promises us long life. So God says this generation, there will be a generation that will start to believe that and who will set their plans and purposes because they know they're going to fulfill their plans and purposes and not die young, not die early. And worship's a major part of that. The presence of God is that healing environment. There's so much involved in that. And so I wrote that book. And then this one, this is just hot off the press. It's called Five Miraculous Hours. And I put here, if you never experienced a miraculous intervention of God in your life or ever doubted it, this book is for you. Just, I've just written this. And this book was about me meeting my biological mother. I'm adopted. I never knew my mother. And I met my biological mother in five hours back in Scotland just a few years ago. Five hours from beginning to end. I was in the same room as her, five hours. And it's a series of miracles, meeting people, names that was mentioned, places that was mentioned, the timing, everything, it's supernatural. And so I had a couple with me from the UK and they said to me, Tom, <clears throat> unless we were with you, nobody would believe that this actually took place. It could be a movie. They said, we, no one would believe that this can happen. It's so supernatural. And so, you know, when it was, when it was all over, I, I remember it was the five hours and then we had to go to the uh, northern party, England to, uh, to do some pastor stuff there. And we got there in the evening and the pastor said to me, he said, Tom, we'll go downstairs because, we, you know, it's, it's kind of cold and it's warmer downstairs and the children's area, children's department. I said, that's great. So we go downstairs and, uh, you know, my, my head is still going from everything that happened that, you know, that day. And, you know, at the back there was a, a painting, a child, child's painting, and it had, it had a, a, a crown. And on the top of the crown was the word grace. And I just happened to look at that and I remembered that. And later the Lord reminded me it was five hours from the nine o'clock till two o'clock in the afternoon when your mother walked in, it was five hours. That was grace. And I says, God, what was all that about? He says, I've taught you a lot about faith, but you don't know much about grace. Grace is when I just come supernaturally intervention and I just do whatever I wanna do. And I realized that God, for this generation, God is gonna do whatever he wants to do. If you and I will dare believe it. He's gonna astound us. He's gonna astound this generation. He's gonna give you every provision that you need. He's gonna give you the people that you need to do the work that he's called you to. He's gonna astound us. Yeah, we, we'll have to work hard, we'll have to pray, we'll have to worship, we'll have to do all that stuff. But on top of that, the last generation will be a generation that God has got his hand on powerfully. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Okay, so I don't know how many of you uh, who of you know Samity? Some of you have done Samity and I encourage you to do it in this, uh, the, in this church if you've done it. Or go to your website. We'll put the website up later for you, samity.org. But I just want to cover some things this morning and lay a bit of a foundation um, <clears throat> because it's really important to know and to have strategy uh, how to come against the enemy in these times. And uh, there's, there's a lot of people get the whole warfare thing reversed. You know, it's, it's just warfare, warfare, warfare. But the basis of all warfare is always worship. So unless we get the foundation of worship, you're never gonna fight. The devil will just laugh at you. So the foundation is always worship. We'll go through it, a few things here. But an interesting thing happened to me. Is everybody happy with the accent, by the way? God speaks to me in a Scottish accent. Years ago, you know, I, thought, there was, I was in America, I was in America preaching, this old guy come up and he says, I don't understand a thing you said. He didn't say it like that, he said in American. He says, I, I don't understand a thing you said. And I thought, okay. He says, but I don't know, he says, I, I quite liked it. 
<laughs> so I said, well, thanks, man. And then I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to get offended by that because God speaks to me. I hear God speak in a Scottish accent. So to me, God is Scottish. Braveheart, give me Scotland or I'll die. Come on, man. You need that spirit, amen. That spirit is rising up in these times. It's a God spirit, not a Braveheart spirit, but a God spirit. We're going to be so powerful, powerfully used by God. Giants, I see a room full of giants here today. And I pray over this conference that God will stir something so powerful in your heart that you'll catch something by the Spirit of God. Because man can do nothing, but the Spirit can do everything. So we trust God for that. So a few years ago, I'm in the church, and this lady comes up to me, we are a little boy. And, and she stands in front of me, and he's looking at me. And she says, Pastor Tom, he thinks you're Jesus. I says, really? She says, yes, he does. So I knelt down and I said to him, I, I'm, not, I'm not Jesus. He just looked at me and I looked at his mom and she says, tell Pastor Tom, you know who Jesus is and he's not Jesus. And he went like that. <laughs> he went, no. So they walked away next week. She comes back, she says, he's not convinced, she still thinks that you're Jesus. And I thought about that, I thought, well, I'm not Jesus, right? And, and neither are you Jesus. But, but the thing is that we are probably the closest thing to Jesus that God has got on the planet. You are Jesus to somebody. Amen? You think about this young generation, I just did a podcast on, on uh, and that's what really stirred something. I had uh, Darren in this church who uh, did the podcast with me and it stirred something because I had another sermon for you. But I thought, I'm going to do this one. And also in the light of what Pastor Ash and I are going to talk about later. But I changed my, my, my sermon last night and, and I'm going to give you something fresh uh, from last night. I just hope it's good. I hope I got it all right. But we let the Holy Ghost do that, all of that. Amen. But I want to say this, that there is a battle for this generation. And we must know the rules of engagement against the enemy. Especially for our children. There's a, an incredible battle for our children. The enemy fears the children. Because the, the reason there's so much abortion and so much everything else, what, and I'll come to this now, he's afraid that, that those children will grow up to become like Jesus. And, and that generation will grow up to become like Jesus. We're going to see some wild things happen, not out of order, but wild in the spirit that is going to happen through a worshiping generation of children. Amen. We, we, we have to get ready for that. We have to prepare our children's ministers for that. And so... Worship and warfare operate together, but the foundation has got to be worship. Listen to this. This is an amazing scripture. I'll read it to you. In 1 Chronicles 25, verse 1, it says, Moreover, David and the captains of the armies, David and the captains of the armies separated for the service some of the sons of Asaph and Heman and Jejuthun, who should prophesy with harps, stringed instruments, and cymbals. Do you, do you hear what that's saying there? It says, it says that the commanders of the army, the military people, actually helped David to choose those who would worship in the temple or the tabernacle. The commanders, the army guys. The principle is this. David knew it was important for them to be included in the process of choosing the worshipers. The reason being is this. The army guys knew something. That's why they were included in choosing. They knew that if it went well in the temple, it would go well in the battlefield. Amen. So they thought, that's why David says, okay, I want you guys to have confidence. And it's incredible, the guys that they chose, they were just army guys, but the guys that they chose were actually prophets. Asaph, Heman, Jejith, and all those guys were, were high-ranking prophets, true prophets of God. But it was the army that chose them because they knew when we go out to battle, these guys are taking care of business in the tabernacle. Oh, hallelujah. When we take care of business in the tabernacle, in the presence of God, things will go well when we go outside the tabernacle, when we go outside the presence of God. That is where our protection is. That is where our security is. It is in his presence. It is spending that time in prayer, spending that time in worship, spending that time in reading of the word. There is no substitute for those things. We can have a lot of fancy ideas and do things, but it's not going to work unless we get back to that place of surely God is more than enough. One of my friends has got one of the greatest churches in the world up in Nigeria. 
and you know, he's been interviewed so many times. He's, he's now building a 100,000 seat auditorium. Cash, 100,000 seat auditorium. And so, um, you know, BBC have been there a few times uh, interviewing him and he said the one time, he says, you know, what, just describe, uh, just describe how, how does one man do all of this? He's got university, two university complexes there, medical research center there. He's got colleges and schools and everything, 350 acres. And the guy says, you know, tell me what is the secret? You, how does one man, how does one man build this? It's a great question. How does one guy do this? And his answer was so simple, but so profound. He says, I'm content with Jesus. I'm just content with Jesus. If I had nothing else, I'm just content with him. That's an incredible thing to say, isn't it? The church has got to get back to that place. We've tried a lot of stuff and we're doing well, we're doing our best, but we've got to get back to that place where he's enough. Hallelujah. We're content with him. And so, judges, we know the principle that the praises went out first, um, in warfare, Judah is, is praise. And uh, they went out before the army went out. And so there's, there's, a, there's a principle there, but the, the end time move of God will probably happen when worship has been established. Because there will be incredible warfare, but unless the worship is established, I'm talking about throughout the nations, unless worship is set in there, even at a home level, then we're never gonna see effective warfare as we should. So God will hopefully protect us from all of that until we get, we get the priorities right. God's heart is to worship him. So worship is not about pulling down strongholds, but enthroning Jesus in our midst. That's what it's all about. The devil, you know, I've, I've taught in this to the guys here, but, but, but worship, the devil is not f frightened at your fast songs or your slow songs. He couldn't care less whether they're fast or slow. What he's frightened of is the authority that is released through worship because worship is always associated with authority. You cannot separate those two things. It's always authority. You know, they, I was reading something profound and it says that only in the last hundred years, worship has been associated with intimacy, which it is. It is, it's an intimate time with God. But the generation before that they understood that worship was associated with authority. And, and we've kind of lost that a little bit. We've kind of lost the authority that there is there in that place of worship. Because in the place of worship, enthronement happens. Amen, he's enthroned. So, so our worship actually enthrones God in our lives, in our circumstances. Hallelujah, amen. So I want to talk about the warfare for inheritance and legacy. Um, there was a multimillionaire guy who was asked a question. They said to him, I suppose you'll give your, your, uh, your millions to your grandchildren and your children. And he says, I don't think so. And they said, well, uh, why would that be? Seems to be the natural thing. He says, well, if I give it to them, they'll probably lose it. But if I show them how to do it the way I did it, then they're gonna do better than I did. I thought that was a great, a great line. And so, you know, when you think about David and Solomon, there's a difference between inheritance and legacy. Inheritance is what is passed on to us usually when someone dies, right? But the legacy is something different. And with Solomon and David, David actually gave Solomon all the wealth that he needed to build the temple. And it was so incredible. People would come from all over and they would look at it and say, this is an, an amazing. You know, but David was actually the guy because he was a worshiper who actually supplied him with everything he needed. And we're gonna see that as well, that, that, that when worship rises up, the wealth will be released. Oh, hallelujah. There's, there's so many connections in worship. Worship is almost so central to everything because God says, it's my priority. God says, you're created to worship me. So get that thing right so everything else can come in line. If we don't prioritize worship and we put something else first, even building churches, if, if, if our priority is just to build churches, we've got the wrong priority. We've got to worship God first, amen? And then build church. 
That's, and I know that sounds a little weird, but we've got to do that. D David says, I'm just content to sit in your presence, Psalm 27. I'm, I'm, I'm content to sit in your presence and just basically gaze at you and then ask who I'm gazing at. And that was what was happening in Tabernacle of David. And so this is what, that's what the millionaire said. And David actually knew something. David says, okay, basically I'll give you what you need, Solomon, to build the temple. I'll give you all the finances. And he did. But Solomon never got David's legacy. Because the Bible says that he did not worship after the way of his father, David. And so he got the inheritance. He did not get the legacy. Amen. And so he couldn't build on what his father had laid the foundation for. God was saying, you ask me for wisdom, I'll give you wisdom. But wisdom wasn't enough. Although he was the wisest man, but it wasn't enough because God is always looking at the heart. So God says, you can have other wisdom you want, but if you, don't, if you don't have the heart like your father, like David, then everything you've got, you'll eventually lose. And that's exactly what happened. And we know he lost and the kingdom was split into two, amen. So I was thinking about that and I thought, well, you know, we've got, we have got quite a, an inheritance. What is our inheritance? Our inheritance is God's word. Would you agree to that? God has given us his word, that's our inheritance. But it's what we do with that inheritance is our legacy. Amen? It's what we do with it, is our legacy. And so we were, we were doing this podcast on children and uh, I've just developed a whole course on, on children um, from the womb uh, right through until teens. God has a lot to say about it. But how we steward this generation because the enemy will continue to try and take our children out and even Christian children, he will, he will come and, and try and take them out because he's afraid of the fact that we might be communicating to them one generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. That we're gonna communicate something great about God's goodness, his majesty, and they will catch that. So there's a war. This is why the abortion thing, as I said, is, is, is rampant. And, uh, and you know, I, I don't know what it's like, in, like here, but suicide in Australia among teenagers is probably the highest in the world, in the most beautiful country. And nobody can explain why that is. Why are these young people killing themselves? So we can see that the, the enemy is at work. So, so where does this whole thing start? Where does this whole worshiping thing start? How can we build a foundation for what's coming? That's what I wanna talk about now. How can we build a foundation for what's coming? There's an incredible story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 13. And it says that Jehoshaphat was surrounded by enemies. All the armies were coming against them. And in the natural, there was no way out. They could not overcome the natural circumstances. And so all these uh, armies are coming against them. And then Jehoshaphat does something. There's a whole series of things that he does. There's fasting, there's teaching the word of God, there's worship, there's praise, and they're distinct the way he sets it out. But one of the things he does is amazing. He, he gets the Judah, which is praise. Judah means praise. And, and the nation is called Judah. And he gets Judah together. And how the nation comes together, because God wants to speak to the nation, but God speaks to the nation through families. It's fascinating. How is God going to build up a nation when the nation is surrounded by great, great enemies? When a nation has gone corrupt, when a nation has gone going under, how is God going to turn that thing around? How is God going to do it? This is the example right here in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 13. And so what he does is it's incredible. But he gets the families together. And so you see a picture of the family, and you've got the father, the mother, the teenager. If you look at the Hebrew, it's all, it's all there. And you've got the baby who's basically in nappies. He can't walk still, you know, he's just finding his feet. And so what happens is there you see this worshiping family. They come together, Judah. But God says, God defines the fathers, not as fathers, but as praisers. Amen. I want you to get this, you, you guys, you men. God defines in that scripture, a man, a father, a husband as a praiser. And it says, and all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their the, the wives and their children. That is, a, that is a picture of the family. 
But God doesn't define the fathers as fathers or the, or the men as husbands. He defines them as praisers. Amen. Can you say amen? So the fathers have got to come in line to take their place as praisers. This is the only way God's going to turn a nation around. This is an incredible example of a nation trusting in God. It happens with the father figure first. The fathers have got to be praisers. That is almost foreign to a lot of our uh, church culture today. We, we let the women do that. Or we let the, we let the youngsters do that because of the music. But the fathers are actually supposed to be the ones that lead in praise. Hallelujah. I'm not getting many enthusiastic amens, but I'll keep going. Amen. I mean, this is foreign to, to most of us. It is the men that's got to be, the men have got to lead the praise in the house. That's what I'm trying to say. Men have got to lead the praise in the house. And then what happens, if, if you read it, I won't go through the scriptures, uh, but as you read it, what happens is there is the worshiping family and all of a sudden the prophet starts to speak and the prophet comes in the midst, in the midst of the worshiping families. And the prophet starts to speak to the families. And he says, you know the scripture, thus saith the Lord, you know, you, you won't have to fight in this battle. The battle is mine. Amen. And that's what he's, you can imagine the, the teenager saying, dad, dad, what did the great prophet say? He says, we don't have to worry because the battle is not ours, but the battle is God's. The wife probably says, just explain that more to the children, uh, uh, Judah, dad, father. We, 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 we don't have to worry. It looks bleak out there, man. It looks like there's no way out. This was a no way out situation. But he says, you know, but he says, God has come in our midst to confirm to us as families. See, it's at that level. It's got to be at that level that everything is going to be okay. And then you know the story. They said, God said ambushments against the armies that was coming against them. And, uh, and they get confused. Because in that scripture, the Lord says, don't be afraid to the family and don't be confused. Don't worry about what's going on. Everything's going to be okay. So we have to eliminate through intimacy with God, through prayer, we have to eliminate all confusion. And that's got to happen at a family level. I've said this for years now, that God is probably not even trying to get into your churches at the moment as much as he's trying to get into our families, our homes. Amen. We often talk about God coming uh, into the church and, and, and that's great, man. But the strength of a church, uh, either a local church or, or a global church, is the strength of the families. Because it is, what the, it is what the families bring from the home into the church that is going to make sense. Amen. I mean, that guy Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming by. And so what Zacchaeus did was he, he heard the miracle worker was coming through town. And so Zacchaeus thought, I'm a short guy. You know who he was, right? I'm a short guy. And uh, if I stand by the, in the crowd, I'll never see Jesus. So he runs ahead of the crowd. And he gets to a place and he thinks, if I climb the tree, I'll get up that tree and I'll see the miracle worker walking past. All he wanted to do was to see the miracle worker walking past. That's all he wanted to do. And so here comes a procession. I don't know if I've preached this here or not, but it doesn't matter. It's a great story. And so here comes a procession and everybody's excited. You can imagine the crowds, man. It's like, whoa, they're all falling. Jesus was popular at that time, right? And they're all falling the miracle worker. And there's a lot of praise and a lot of stuff going on. And Jesus is walking in front of everybody else. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Jesus stops in his tracks. You can imagine the crowd saying, what's happening? Don't know, but Jesus is speaking to someone. He's speaking to someone up a tree. Oh, this is powerful, man. And so, and so Jesus starts to speak to Zacchaeus up the tree. In other words, this guy's positioning. This is where the church is. This guy's positioning to make sure he saw the Christ stop Jesus in his tracks. Wherever Jesus was going, he changed his mind. And he said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to come to your house. Zacchaeus gets on the phone. I'm just making this bit up. Just relax. Zacchaeus gets on the phone and he said to, he said to uh, his wife, you know, Maggie, he says, hey, Maggie, I've got, someone, I've got someone really important coming today. She says, who is it? Another person you're dragging home? He says, no, th th this, this person is special. Who is it? He says, well, it's actually God. I'm bringing God home today. 
Come on, man. I'm, I'm bringing, I'm, God wants to visit our home. How did this happen, Zacchaeus? Oh, I just climbed a tree. It's a long story. I'll tell you when I get home. But just make sure you change the sheets and everything's okay. But can you, I want you to get this picture now because this is prophetic for what Jesus is saying to the church right now. He's trying to get into your homes. He goes to their home. You can imagine, man. Probably Jesus rested. Doesn't tell us he stayed overnight, but he probably rested in Zacchaeus' bed. Oh, hallelujah. He probably played with the children. He probably laid hands on the children. Can you imagine? Those wee boys and those wee girls growing up, they would have been different. Why are you different? Why are you different? Because one day, come on, one day, because one day there was a man came to your house. His name was Jesus. And he touched me on the head and I have never been the same since. Guys, prophetically, this is gonna happen to this generation. As we teach our children to be, to be open to the things of God, we're gonna see an army of warriors raised up that will be astounding. And people outside will know there's something different about you, little Mary. There's something different about you, little George. Where, where have you been? This is the point. The devil often doesn't know where you've been. <laughs> When, when you and I, I, I spend a lot of time in prayer and in worship, obviously, but I spend a lot of time, a lot of time every day. That is my priority. Every day I do it. And, and, and you know, I'm praying in the spirit for a long time. And I'm walking and I, and I, and I do all that stuff. And, and I come home and one day the Lord said to me, he says, you know, you, the, 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 you, you're bamboozling the, the enemy. You're bamboozling the devil. And I says, how does that, how does that work? He says, because he doesn't know where you've been. When you've been with me, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know the mysteries and the things that we're talking about. He doesn't know the plans and purposes that I'm putting in your heart. He has no idea. He's guessing. But he's no idea. He doesn't know where you've been. But the devil knows if you haven't been anywhere. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> where have you been, man? You see what I'm saying? This generation is moving into that realm, that space of being in his presence and will come out with incredible things. Incredible things. That's why we got to dream. Never let your, you know, your past, your memories exceed your dreams. I cover this in one of my books. Never let your memories. We're in that place where we're dreaming. We're not thinking of the good old days. There is no good old days. The only day that you'll ever live is today, right now, right? God is focused on your day right now. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going off track a little bit. I don't know if I'll get back to that, but I, I want to say this. There's a scripture in, in Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm reading it and I thought, I know this scripture. The Lord says, you don't know it. So now I don't say I know anything. But I was reading through that scripture and the scripture says, the, the scripture says, listen to this because this will encourage you. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. So God says, Tom, I know what I'm thinking towards you. I know. Do you know that God's thinking about you all the time, by the way? There's not a microsecond where God is not thinking about you. Not a microsecond. If God forgot about you for a second, you would be lost for an eternity. That's one of my better lines. <laughs> Amen. If he, if, if he forgot about you for a second, you'd be lost for an eternity. Sometimes I think we don't know what we've got. Sometimes I think we don't know what salvation is. We have no idea of the greatness of Almighty God that has come into our lives and the possibilities. So God is thinking about you all the time. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. So what is God thinking about you right now as you sit there? What is God thinking about? He's thinking about your peace. Actually, God is not thinking about your future. You might be, but he's not. He's thinking about your peace. And then it says, to give you a hope and a future. Amen. Now watch this, how this works. God says, Tom, I'm thinking about your peace. So you've got to get into a peaceful place every single day because that's what I'm thinking about. Get into that place of peacefulness. Because when you're in that place of peacefulness, your future will look after itself. That doesn't mean that we don't plan. We have to plan. But we have to be in a state of peace. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. With thanksgiving, saturate your life with thanksgiving. 
Saturate your life with thanksgiving. Do it all the time. Be over the top. Get drunk, as it were, in the subject of thanks. Thank God I'm delivered. Thank God I'm set free. Thank God I've been taken from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Thank God the Holy Ghost is, is living in inside of me. Thank God I'm gonna go to heaven one day. Thank you, Lord, I can't stop thanking you. I cannot stop thanking you. I will not stop thanking you. Not because I have to, it's not a religious thing. It's because I've got a revelation of the Christ in the inside. I cannot stop thanking you. I will not stop thanking you. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of his enemy. Amen. Can't stop thanking you. And so, the importance of fathers is amazing. I don't know how much time I've got left. Okay, because I'm not doing very well here. I'll, I'll go a few more minutes, and because and, uh, I want to just get through this ba the basics of this. So, so, Talking about thinking, here's how God thinks about children. We're, we're kind of leaning towards the generation that's emerging. So that's what I felt led uh, to talk about this morning, this worshiping generation. Here's how God thinks about uh, children and in fact, every, every individual that's ever lived. There's a scripture in uh, Genesis 1.1. If you can't find that, we've got problems. But in Genesis 1.1, uh, it, it says in Genesis 1.1 that God created the heavens and the earth. Is that what it says? Help me, is that what it says? Okay. In the beginning, God created, created, created the heavens and the earth. The word created there, the Hebrews say, this is a special word that is not thrown around. This word is only used by God in special times. It, it actually means a one-off production. It means there'll never be another world. Genesis 1-1 actually tells us there'll never be another, there's no other world like this one. So are these guys sending stuff out there meant to try and find other worlds? Genesis 1-1 tells you, it's a one-off production. The earth that we, you and I live in is a one-off production. It'll, there'll never be another one. This is it, man. Amen. And so that's good. But then in Isaiah 43 in verses 7 and 21, it talks about that God has created you to praise him. And so he uses the same word that he used in Genesis 1-1. The word that he uses is when God created you to praise him, you're a one-off production. There'll never be another, another you. There's never been another you and there'll never be another you. You're a one-off, which I think is incredible. So this word, there is seven different parts in this word but I'm gonna give you three of them and I want you to think about these regarding how God sees our children and how God sees actually you as an individual. When God created you specifically to praise him, in that word, the first thing is this, that God says, I have created you unique. You're a one-off production. That means that there has never been another you, there will never be another you. What that actually means is that you are actually a unique experience to God. Amen. God says, I've never experienced another you. I've never experienced another Tom Ingalls. I've never experienced anybody like that. So you can imagine God, God is, is been thinking about you forever. In eternity past, you've always been in the mind of God. And then all of a sudden, God in his wisdom says, I'm going to allow Tom to be created at this particular time for a particular purpose. So you can imagine the excitement in God because God says, I'm waiting for an experience that I've never experienced before. Hallelujah. Amen. I've never experienced anybody like this before. This is a new experience. Amen. So it means unique. Unique. The way you pray, the way you worship, the way you trust God, God says, I've never had anybody that does it the way you do it. I love it. And I'm not comparing you with anybody else because the way you do it is the way that I will experience it like nobody else can do it. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. The second part of the word means that you are valuable. The actual word means that you've got inherent value. And that's easy to understand because when we're, when we're every, every person who's ever been created is valuable. But when we get born again, the value just increases exponentially, right? because we now carry the greatest treasure on the planet. Amen. So God says, you've become very valuable to me. 
Amen. In other words, he says, because you carry the Christ, the value that you carry is incomparable. The potential is incomparable. That's why we have to meditate on these things. God, who do we carry and what is the potential? With, with man, it is impossible. With, with God, all things are possible. And your value increases. This is incredible. The word, the word actually means that your value can actually increase the more you get to know Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So our value in, so we become more valuable to God and we become more valuable to the world. The third thing, I'm going to go through this quickly, is this barrier creation that you and I are, are capable of transformation. In other words, says, Tom, when I created you and you get born again, you start at a low level, but you are capable, listen, you are capable of being transformed into the very image of Christ. Hallelujah. So, you know, as we get near to the end of the age, before Jesus returns, we are feeling this incredible acceleration of transformation at an individual level. Our hearts are being changed more towards God every single day. It's incredible. That's why we feel the change. We're feeling there's something on the go. God is preparing our hearts because the transformation takes place not at a mind level, but at a heart level. And that's what God uses, right? Amen. So he says you're, 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 you're capable of transformation. What that means is this, is that you, are, you have the potential to become exactly, exactly what God has planned for you to become. And God says, I can do this, man. I can do this. I can do this. If you will allow me, I can transform you. I can change you to become the very person that the Trinity have spoken about in eternity past. You have the potential. Otherwise, he would never have created you, right? So the transformation process is going on. So that's how God sees our valuable children. Our children are so special. They have that potential of being, of being unique, being valuable, we think, our, we think our children are valuable. I've got eight grandchildren now, and man, they're all so valuable. But, but it's okay me thinking they're valuable. Can you imagine how God thinks? Amen. I'm gonna stop, I'll stop with one last thing, two minutes. The importance of mothers. So we've talked to the fathers, right? The importance of mothers in rearing this end time generation. So we saw that God defines fathers as praisers. God defines mothers is joyful. Mary was having Jesus, gonna have Jesus, the angel pitches up, right? Gabriel, and, and the first thing that he says to her is rejoice. Seems a bit weird, doesn't it? Rejoice, you've been, you're highly favored and you're gonna carry the Christ. You're gonna carry the Christ, basically, I'm paraphrasing it. But the first thing he says was rejoice. So mothers then, have got to be joyful to rear children. Birthing is the atmosphere of joy. You're very quiet. You're thinking about these things? But birthing is the atmosphere of joy. In other words, if you're going to birth a business, there's got to be a joyful atmosphere for you to birth it. So Jesus, Mary must have thought, wow, this is a serious thing. It wasn't just, hey, hello. The angel wasn't just saying, hello, how are you, Mary? It wasn't that kind of greeting. It was like, rejoice. Mary, you got to get this right. If you're going to carry the Christ child, you have to bring him up in an atmosphere of joy. You have to. So you can see how God was, was trusting man. God trusts you and I to do the impossible things. So Jesus, we know from that, that Jesus would have grown up in an atmosphere of joy. And that's what mothers have got to be. Fathers have got to be praiseful, praisers. And mothers have got to be joyful. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Mothers need strength, right? Moms go through a lot of stuff. Gosh, they go through, oh, we often think that men have got it easy, but moms go through stuff. But it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I will love you, O oh Lord, my strength. I love this. I will love you, O oh Lord, my strength. I will love you, O oh Lord, my strength. I will love you, O oh Lord, my strength. 
I was walking up the hill. I woke up some, some time ago and, and, I, and I know the scripture. I can quote the whole, the whole psalm basically. But it says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And I'm walking up, I'm saying that, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And the Lord said to me, as long as you keep loving me, strength keeps coming to you. Hallelujah. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and him will I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be safe from my enemies. Oh, hallelujah. Strength. Every day I walk up that hill, it's a steep hill. Every day I'm saying strength is coming to me because I'm loving you in the process. Strength is coming to me. Strength is coming to my wife. Strength is coming to my family. Strength is coming to my ministry because I'm in love with you. These things are simple. We've made it complicated, man. We've made it so complex. It is so simple. God says just believe the simple stuff. Believe the simple, take, take a line and just believe the simple stuff. I will love you, oh Lord, my strength. Amen. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. I'm sorry if I've gone over. I'm not sure of the time here. 11 o'clock. Are we okay? All right. Just lift your hands and just start to thank God and just praise Him. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've heard. Father, we thank you that the Holy Ghost will just help us to solidify the truths that we've heard today. Thank you, Father, for your word. Come on, just release it through your, you're all mature, I'm sure. Just release it through your voice. Just start to thank God. Start to thank God for your salvation right now. Thank God that he's delivered you. Thank God that he set you free. Just thank him right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, release that strong from your lips this morning. Just thank him. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, take, take these words and penetrate them deep into your hearts, Lord. Lord, let this generation be a generation that rises up in great strength, in great strength. Show us how to prepare for that which lies ahead and be more than prepared for it, Father. Father, we thank you that the church that you're raising up is a glorious church. We thank you, Lord, that we will not fall down, but we will rise up. We thank you right now there's a rising up even in the hearts of those people here, there's a rising up. There's an encouragement. There's an expectation right now. And we bless you for it, that you will do it by your spirit because you've said you're going to have a glorious church. And Father, we become candidates for that. We put our hands up and we say, God, choose me. Choose me. Whatever it takes, choose me. And everybody says, amen. God bless you. Thank you.